years ago, uh, it was uh, uh, research that was done by the Legal Aid Forum. And uh, amongst many other things that they produced was um, uh, a section on bail, and bail being a constitutional right. And speaking to one of the guys uh, that did the report, um, their concerns that uh, some of the issues being raised in there are recurrent, especially around the right to bail uh, of late, and especially maybe one that comes immediately into my mind is the case that has been ongoing around people who allegedly caused uh, loss to the government, including somebody who unwillingly sold his property to the government and was denied bail. So I, I, I think we still have issues around our judicial sector and um, understanding that bail is actually a right. Yeah, so um, I, I, it's disturbing that we are not progressing as fast as we should be in our judicial sector. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Well, we're here tonight to talk about the reopening of Rwanda's tourism industry. Belize, thanks once again for joining the show. Uh, there's been lots of talk on social media, off social media, uh, about what this means for Rwandans, what this means for um, the hospitality and tourism sector. I know we talked about this last week um, regarding the Rwanda Economic Recovery Fund, and um, so we thought it fitting to have a follow-up conversation uh, regarding tourism. So we know that um, last week Rwanda RDB uh, announced the resumption of tourist activities. Uh, just to kick off, Belize, if you could tell us um, what does this um, resumption of um, tourism activities, what does it entail? Um, if you can just give us the key points. And what was the decision to, to do this, especially since we are still within um, the coronavirus uh, global pandemic? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for having me tonight. Um, I'm very excited to talk about this topic. Um, uh, first of all, what this entails is that we've reopened our rather cabinet uh, resolutions of uh, the 16th of June announce um, the reopening of, of domestic tourism and international tourism, but with the specific element for the international tourism. I will elaborate further on that. And um, a day after, um, RDB announced, uh, put up a public notice, and we um, elaborated on, on a couple of um, specific guidelines uh, in, terms with, in terms of the reopening. So. Um, what we are um, uh, doing is that we've opened domestic tourism and international tourism specifically for um, a private jet or rather charter flights, uh, whether it's individuals or groups. Um, so in brief, that's what it entails. Um, secondly, the reason why um, uh, we have uh, uh, decided to open um, I believe um, you know this you know personally I think, COVID is something that we, we are going to have to live with uh, for a while. Um, the economy has suffered uh, greatly, uh, specifically for, uh, for the tourism industry. Um, you know, uh, you'd be interested to know that in March, we saw a drop of 54% in terms of arrivals. Of course, um, April and May was 100%. Um, so that means a lot. That means a lot for the government. That also means, of course, a lot for the private sector. You know, can you imagine the hotels were closed, everything was shut down. Um, so um, as, 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 as COVID progresses, I will say, or as, as this pandemic progresses, I think it's where, you know, um, we have to take some bold move and some calculated risks, if I can call it like that, and open up uh, slowly. Uh, but um, what I would like to say um, to, to you and, and to the viewers is that uh, Rwanda is ready. Um, we've had, uh, from, from, for inter international tourists, for example, we've had several meetings with uh, the aviation sector, uh, several meetings with the Ministry of Health, um, thinking thoroughly about that experience of the international uh, tourists. Um, the guidelines that you see here took uh, you know, a huge amount of, of back and forth trying to figure out, you know, how do we balance the experience of the tourists and safety? And that's how we came up with these specific guidelines. Mm -hmm. If you could just share more, uh, before I let Berna and Charles weigh in, if you could just share some more on what are the safety measures, not only for international tourists, but also domestic tourists, um, to, just to protect them against the, you know, the coronavirus. Well, I think the first, first and foremost is the basics, you know, um, you know to wear masks, to wash, the hand, to wash your hands, 
And you have to understand that we have to look at the tourists as the, as the consumer, but you also have to think about the operators, you know. And uh, the tourism industry is, is made of so many players. You know, we talk about hoteliers, we talk about tour operators, guides, you know, um, people who own kayaking activities, uh, people who own private uh, uh, beaches, private lake houses, etc. So um, uh, the, the first thing is, is the basic, you know, you have to wear a mask, um, you have to wash your hands, you know, you have to keep the, the, the one meter to two meter distance. Um, I think if you go specifically in the, in the, in the guidelines, you find all these details. But you also have to note that um, there are also specific protocols that have been developed for those operators. And those have been sent directly to uh, the tourism chamber, uh, whereby a hotelier has the detailed, um, uh, a detailed checklist of what he has to have uh, in order to actually open safely for himself or herself, for his staff and for his clients coming towards him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Charles, uh, Brenner, is there something you'd like to add? Um, I think it's extremely impressive uh, and bold, uh, as, as Belize has put it, that uh, we, we've taken the, the stride to, to open. Um, even though it's not fully open, the fact that it's partially open, I guess the same can be said of, of uh, the other spots, you know, the bars, even though bars are not yet open, but um, a, place, uh, uh, a place where one can uh, uh, responsibly indulge. Uh, the restaurants, I, I, I think it's a step in the right direction because their livelihoods and, um, as Belize rightfully put it, there is... Um, to a very large extent, because the value chain is extremely long, uh, we have to open. I also commend RDB to a very, very large extent and uh, the fact that there's huge investment that has been put in the high-end tourism mm. and therefore that investment has to be protected. Uh, one way in which it can be protected is ensuring that those big spenders can come into the country and actually spend and protecting how they will spend and how everybody who eats a bit of their money will be kept safe. Mm. Um, I guess as the show progresses, we'll be talking about the other aspects of the tourism, but uh, kudos to, to everybody who's behind the, the thinking of the reopening. Yeah. 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 And I like, Belize, I like the way you said um, we are taking a bold decision, uh, mm. but it also calculated risk. Mm -hmm. uh, Brenna, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, just to say that, um, I mean, if you look at... Uh, Tourism has to be looked at within um, the whole um, government of Rwanda response to, to COVID. Um, we know that uh, right from the start, uh, the government of Rwanda has really done everything it can. One, to contain, two, to um, ensure that um, safety measures are in place around the country and, you know, try to enforce which is not something that we saw many countries do. But right now, uh, I think uh, there was a, um, a poll, I think, online, um, uh, right from Germany, that uh, painted the picture. You know, Rwanda is currently uh, ranked as low risk. Um, even when internally we don't, uh, you know, we still see it's the same measures. There's a lot of enforcement uh, around this. But that goes to tell you that... Um, people are doing, have done the hard work of, of trying to uh, restore confidence. And so when you see uh, government opening up, it's again pointing to the work they have done. They are very confident uh, in, 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 what, in whatever decision they make. Now, I think um, the question on and, and, uh, many people's mind is around the refocusing on domestic tourism uh, because our strategy uh, for, for for the last couple of years has been outward looking and now suddenly we have to be inward looking. Uh, so it would be good to know um, from, um, from the tourism, uh, um, the chief tourism officer, what kind of uh, initiatives are in place to drive the domestic tourism. Because for many Rwandans, um, I'm sure you, you saw this on social media, uh, when, when the rates for the Godina families were out, you know, you saw the responses. Um, how do you um, get them to understand that um, if you go to a hotel right now, it's being patriotic, 
you know, um, and, and what do I mean by being patriotic if you go to a hotel, uh, you know, out of town today? That hotel employs Rwandans, um, your creative value, you know. So I would like to hear more in terms of how you, you know, you're kind of re-strategizing to ensure that domestic tourism actually picks up. Thank you. Um, it's a very good question. And I also like to, to, to commend uh, Rwandans who actually have even taken um, uh, uh, trips and traveled uh, during uh, uh, the first Ember Rwanda campaign that we, we launched. Um, so, so actually targeting domestic tourism uh, is something that we started about uh, uh, three to four years ago. And, um, you know, the, the, look, I think Relying on international tourists is, is valid, especially for, you know, in terms of uh, in financial terms. Um, but when you talk about, um, you know, when you, when, we, when you have to rely on a market, you, know, you can only rely on the domestic market. And it's in crises like this that you actually can prove that this theory it works. Now, um, I believe that this domestic tourism uh, 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 promotional campaign is not going to actually be difficult for us to implement because, you know, we've, we, we understand already the market. And I think when you understand the market, when you understand what drives them, when you understand their needs, um, what ticks them, you know, what, they, what they, they, they're very sensitive on, um, if you understand the demographics, it's very easy to actually craft a campaign. So. Um, I'll give you a couple of, 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 of stats that we've, uh, we've gathered in the research that we did before launching this domestic market or even crafting the domestic market campaign. And um, so you'll be interested to know that last year we had 76,000 leisure visitors and who are spending, who are spending an average of uh, 47,000 Rwandan francs per overnight trip. And um, that, that was, that's a research that, uh, was, uh, that we, was derived from some data from NISR in 2017. Um, the the, the 20, 20 to 40 years old uh, make up the vast majority of leisure visitors. Um, a second interest, uh, interesting insight is that 65 of leisure travelers are male and 35% are female. So we have more men, domestic male tourists yes. than female yes. domestic and, uh, tourists. And, uh, and maybe I'll say it off air, uh, there is an interesting <laughs> theory from our stats uh, people. Yeah. Uh, but um, the, second in, the third interesting insight is that 80% um, uh, of, uh, of domestic tourists uh, travel by bus or car and most of them come from Kigali going outwards. And the most popular destination for locals, of course, is the eastern and, and western and eastern provinces. 30, 31% are overnight visitors, and 69% are same-day travelers. 58% stay with friends and relatives, while 40% stay in hotels. And then in terms of monthly income, uh, 6,500, more than 6,500 travelers earn between 100,000 and 500,000 francs, and uh, more than 1,400 have an income of above 500,000. Mm. And in terms of the expat, um, we have an expat market size of approximately 15,000 people. So what this um, um, various insight um, um, help us to craft First of all, we understood that uh, most Rwandans do not spend, do not do overnight travels. So we had to find a way to ensure that the packages that are going to be available on the market intensify and uh, put some sort of like in incentives mm -hmm. for people to travel from their, from their destination of origin and stay one, at least one night. And you will see in the packages that we have, we are, we are saying, you know, if you go in a group and you stay one night, then you are eligible for a 10% or 15% discount for, um, for mountain gorillas. Um, an additional 15% discount from the $200. Um, the other thing that we did is that we understood that, you know, Rwandans like to go in groups, you know. So you have to make packages that are for groups. You have to make packages that have to be families, etc. 
and we even segmented our target, uh, our target market, our domestic target market. We're talking about you know, families, we're talking about high-end um, high uh, leisure uh, uh, spenders, because we do have that bracket as well in Rwanda. You know, we talk about families, and you're talking about groups that have an, a common interest. Mm. For example, hiking, for example, you know, you know, girls who actually travel in groups, you know, uh, they have a retreat every, I don't know, every year, every month. So we managed to actually group those ones. So with that set of information, we were able to approach the private sector and pitch, you know, let's come up, with, let's do a partnership, RDB and the private sector, and craft uh, uh, packages that will answer all these these um, these target groups and their specific needs. So mm -hmm. that that is how we um, we've come up to this uh, to this domestic uh, promotional campaign. Uh, I have a quick question. I, I, see, I see Charlie is very eager with a couple of questions, but my my question is very. Um, I don't know if you can answer it now, uh, Belize, but uh, these nice packages, the incentivized packages, if I may call them, you know, the reduction of two hundred dollars um, from one thousand five hundred dollars for local. Uh, domestic tourists, and so forth and so on. Um, are they here to stay? How long are they here to stay? Uh, number one. And number two, um, yeah, maybe let's just start with that. How long are they here to stay? Uh, yes, and the second one is, um, do we also have a decrease in hotel rates? Um, for instance, whether it's high end or whether it's just, you know, your usual, yeah. is also a decrease in, 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 in rates of hotels. Yeah. Um, so the, this campaign, this promotional, this promotional campaign is... Um, uh, is supposed to end uh, in December 31st okay. uh, this year, um, but with potential to be reviewed and be extended. Um, that, of course, de depends on the demand uh, and other factors, mm. um, especially, look, we're talking about a pandemic that we, you know, we don't know how in the next month or two months is going to work out. Um, uh, to, to, to your question of hotels, and, and, and uh, yes, you know, definitely, um, from high-end hotels, we have interesting packages that you found on the website. I hope that you'll be able to, um, yes. uh, to put up the website, the link uh, where the public can actually go and, and get some, uh, some information on different packages. But we do have um, hotels that have actually put their prices and come up with very good packages. Uh, one of them... That is very exciting is Singita. Uh, you all know that Singita is one of the top. I think everyone knows about Singita. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone knows about Singita. Yes. And um, what is interesting is that they understand that this is, this is a national campaign, this is a national need. Um, it's not really about the money, it's about really aligning with, with what the government is looking forward to. And we're trying to actually gather more uh, of these high end um, um, uh, operators, high end hotels to reduce the prices so that they can actually accommodate domestic and, and foreign residents. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just uh, clarify I, something? Yeah. Yes, um, the, the, the last time I went um, close to Singita, you had to make sure that you've booked, they have your details before you arrive and all this. Are these things still in place? Um, can Rondons go and have lunch there and not stay there? Because there were restrictions, like you can't just access the property. Um, I, I would like to explain to you why, um, you know, it's not easy to go to these properties just for lunch. You know, it's not, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a business type of hotel like the Marriott, the Radisson, the Serena, that you can just go in and have a meeting. Um, th these kind of properties actually sell an experience, you know. So when you sell an experience, there are some set of rules that you have to put up. Um, you know, it, it's... it's when you talk about the experience, it talks about the service. So just imagine you have um, 20 people in a, in, a, in a hotel or in a, in a lodge, in an ultra-luxury ultra lodge like Singita. Um, and you have all of a sudden 20 additional people that are coming just for lunch. Just imagine the chaos, you know. Um, they prefer to keep it, you know, uh, a strict. Only people who are actually staying at the hotel will be you know, enjoying the facilities, will be enjoying the, 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 the services, just to ensure that the experience is top-notch. Um, they're, paying, they're paying quite a, a, a chunk of money, and I, I think if I'm, if I'm to pay that kind of money, I, I don't think I'll want to be, you know, mingling with, you know, people who are just coming for lunch and, you know. So I think that, that understanding needs to be as well uh, um, uh, taken into account. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just wanted on a lighter note, it's an exclusive club, uh, but <laughs> you, you, you know, if you're spending 4,000 a night, you really want to know your neighbor's puppy. <laughs> neighbor's puppy. <Wow. laughs> but but I, I, I really, um, my, my, my point around uh, domestic tourism is based on the fact that of the goodies that COVID-19 has brought us. That um, uh, whoever cares to listen is now going to understand the importance of domestic tourism. And I, I would be very, very keen to learn on the, and if there's an audit or an evaluation that has been done around the Tembe Rwanda campaign that started, uh, like stand to be corrected, uh, Belize two years ago mm -hmm. or, or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a praise of that because it was thought of even before COVID. Uh, however, when you look at the investment, and, and, and I can, back to my earlier point at the beginning of the show, appreciating why chartered flights and so on are, are being encouraged to, to, I mean, have been given leeway to, to begin. I mean, I don't know whether you knew, Bana and Diana, that, uh, that that when the guests come on these flights, they, they're not taken to your Kawaida holding centers as they wait for their results, they're taken to the Marriott. So it tells you about the caliber of, of, of people that are there. So it is reflective of the investment that has been done by RDB to attract this high, these big spenders. So I would also want to understand uh, an appraisal that has been done for the Temberu Rwanda uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. And now that we really want to push for domestic tourism, are we ready to make the same investment? Mm -hmm. Have we made the same investment? What percentage of that budget that was read two days ago is, is going into domestic tourism? Domestic because tourism. Yeah. these things work in a very, very straightforward way. Dollar in, dollar out. You, you, you reap what you sow. You know, you, you, it pains me so much that the Kigali Golf Club has been closed for a, a revamp for several months, months yes. and we probably still have several months to go. An entrepreneur who had an idea to do a, 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 an upcountry golf resort, he's had no road done for probably 12 years. Um, you have an, uh, another investor who did a resort in um, the Eastern Province in Bujeser, I think, uh, La Palice, the, the, the road going there is, 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 is a nightmare. You don't want to go back. When you mm. get there and even mosquitoes bite you and the place is awful, <laughs> you're like, I won't blame the guy mm. because after all, all the efforts he's made and, uh, 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 you know, the, the reward is not, uh, I mean, no, is not being recognized. And you could also say the same about Karonj and Chibuya with all the facilities that are down there. If you look at the new property that's going to be I think it's by Mantis and other few people who have done hotels. There's um, the Comoran and, and, mm -hmm. and there's a little, that's where I come from, so I know that area fairly mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I think the investment, if we want to reap from, from domestic tourism, we have to equally match uh, that investment. I don't see that uh, uh, being done. I hope it's going to be done. And, and Charlie, yeah. just to yeah. lay in very quickly, um, there's, there's a, I went to, to Mombasa a couple of years back, I think uh, two years back, and they had, um, I was really impressed by it, and, and I, I, I want to build and ask you, Belize, uh, just building on what Charles said, but I just want to share this uh, example very quickly. Um, it, we were at um, Diani Resort Beach, and I think there for a couple of days, but they had a fantastic package for Kenyans. Um, and for us, it was a great package. I mean, they can afford to do this, but I was really impressed to see that you know, there were not lots of foreigners uh, during this season of theirs. A lot of Kenyans um, really have incentives. They understand it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a national thing to go and visit your country. And there are packages that enable them to do that. So my question to, uh, based on this experience, you know, I came back to Rwanda and I thought to myself, wow, this is amazing. But with Temburu Rwanda, I, I really, maybe I, I didn't do enough research or I didn't uh, you know, bother to investigate much, but I thought that the packages for local tourists at that time, um, you know, right now we've been affected by COVID, was still a bit too much on the high end for me to take my family and my kids, you know, if that's the case, uh, and have a spend the night sort of thing, because those packages I thought were not, they were not really speaking to Rwanda. So Belize, if you could just share with us, do Rwanda, is it a myth? Do Rwandans just do not visit places in their country? 
or are these packages just not connecting with what Rwandans can afford or what Rwandans want? So the domestic um, tourism campaign, how, if you can speak a bit more on that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I think I will, I'll take the first question from Charles. From Charles. Yes. Um, you talked about an audit. Yes, there was an audit and an appraisal done. Um, you know, I would gladly share uh, the details uh, after here, but it has um, helped us, of course, shape, you know, uh, this campaign. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, you know, you ha we have to invest in this, in this, um, in this, domestic, uh, this domestic market. Um, not, just, not just in terms of RDB or the tourism aspect itself, but, you know, the whole surrounding, you know, infrastructure, um, you know, um, you know, um, you know, think about, you know, utilities, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we juggle the utility bills, you know, so that, you know, the hotels can actually adjust their prices for, you know, the domestic market. I think we have to come up with a creative way of doing it. Um, I think what COVID has actually taught us is that, you know, we have to think within first, mm, you know, we have to make it work within. Uh, and of course, you know, relying on, on the region and, 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 and beyond the region, but we have to start within. And when you start within, maybe I'll t come to your, uh, to your question, um, Diane, Diana. Um, I think it, it's a cultural thing, you know. Uh, that's one. It's a cultural thing. Two is a, is a, uh, is a need aspect. I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, I don't think Rwandans needed to travel. You know, there's things that they needed, and if you it just it's actually the um, the Maslow triangle of needs. Mm. So <laughs> it's you know it, we just have to go with the reality. You know, you cannot compare Kenya and Rwanda. Mm. You know, we, we 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 don't operate the same way. We don't have the same history. You know, you know we don't have the same needs. You know, the Kenyan tourism industry is about a hundred years old. We cannot compare that. The Rwandan tourism industry is like, what, 25 years old? Probably even less, less than 20. Yeah, less than yeah, 20. Yeah. So I think we have to be fair to ourselves first, and we have to try to understand that, you know, we can't compare things that are incomparable. Mm. That's one. Two, we have to also be, uh, when you talk about being fair, is that, look, uh, you know, uh, like I, I think I've shared the, the, the the income level that we, 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 we crafted. And you have to understand that not everyone is going to travel, you know? Traveling is a luxury. It's not a, it's not a, it's not, it's not a road, you know? It's not school. I think Rwandans have these specific needs they have to care for before even thinking about travel. But it doesn't mean that as government of Rwanda, we don't, you know, we don't encourage Rwandans to travel. So I think, we have to be fair with ourselves. You know, we have to understand that we're coming from far, and this aspect of traveling is even new. And I also think that we, we also even need to change, you know, the language that Rwandans don't travel. They do travel, you know. In December last year, if you try to go to Rubavu, all hotels were full. You try to go to Akagera, all hotels were full. That alone is an indication that, yeah, Rwandans do travel. That was not, that was not, um, that was not international tourists, mm. you know? More, December is actually our lowest season. It's actually part of our low season. So people who fill up these places are Rwandans. Um, secondly, for uh, another indication is that for Akagera uh, National Park, mm -hmm. uh, more than 50% of, of uh, of visitors of Akagera National Park are actually Rwandans, are locals. So I think we need to be fair to ourselves. Um, and back to the packages that we've crafted, these are just among so many packages. And you do not need a package to travel, you know? We have access to technology, you know? You can easily go on a map, you know, and say, okay, I want to visit Huye, you know? Google what's interesting to see in Huye. Honestly, I think, you know, we need to be a little bit fair even to government of Rwanda. They can't, can't do everything. If you, need, if you have that need to travel to discover your country as, a, as in a form of a patriotic move, then use the means that you have. You know, we've created a website that has a lot of information, you know, has a lot of information about your country. Uh, you can call a mayor. You can call a governor, you know. 
I think there's so many ways you can actually find things to do in Rwanda. You can call RDB, you can step into the sales and reservation. We have sales and reservation offices all over the country. So these packages are things that we crafted, again, to answer one of the needs of the segments that we've realized that, um, that do not want to hustle. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the lower tier, for example, someone, a, a young, a young you know, a couple that wants to go on a honeymoon, you know, Easily doesn't, they don't need a package per se, you know. They can call Rubavu, well, Rubavu is on lockdown, not wrong example, but, you know, they can call, they can go to uh, Huye. Huye, you know, they can go to um, uh, Epic Hotel in Yagatare, you know, and spend the weekend there. They could do a staycation in Kigali. There's so many things you can do that that doesn't necessarily mean that these packages will answer. Mm. Yeah. I, 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 I'll defy a little bit, and I think... I'm glad that you're thinking and still innovating uh, because packages, I think the, 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 the language in your world is called products, you know, yeah. Uh, some of these products that have been, that are in place are not necessarily Rwandan and I'll give an example mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, say, if you go to, to Kineji, mm -hmm. there's a cultural village there. When you go to that cultural village there, they teach you how people used to hunt and uh, there's a group of ex-poachers who are telling you how they used to kill gorillas, gorillas and yes. you go to who, who, somewhere who, who else. Who have now become protectors. Yes, they know, go to somewhere gorillas. else and they're teaching you how to eat isombe and, mm -hmm. and like how appealing is that to me mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm a domestic tourist and mm -hmm spent my money to, I don't spend my money to go and be taught how to poach mm. or how people used to poach. So I think there's a little bit of innovativeness uh, uh, that, that, that is required. And um, uh, when, when you probably go to Rubavu, you find that people there are, are, are more innovative. So then you ask yourself uh, around R&D, I think that's where a bit of thinking needs to be done. And, mm. and what, our, what used to appeal to our parents does not appeal to us, does not appeal to our children. I mean, I remember um, uh, the other Christmas going with my family to, to Chiniji, and um, we were being taught how to make bushera. Now, for my wife and I, there was a thrill around drinking the bushera after, mm -hmm. after we, we've made it. But my children, who are part of the, of the experience, were like, oh, I, what's this? You know, so... It's, I think there's, the point is really that you, you, you have uh, to, to, to get a bit more innovative about this. But I also want to make another point uh, around having a long-term view of these things. And I will agree with Belize entirely about the partnership aspect. That all of us as Randys and even the, the Auditor General when they come in to, to quiz you guys or the parliamentarians and so on and so forth. Domestic tourism is a marathon, and we, let's face it, some of our peers or those who are a little bit above us would be more comfortable to drive 40 kilometers to Gahembe or another 40 kilometers to Nyagasambo to eat rare meat, mm. rarely ordinary meat, but that is uniquely prepared. Mm. Spend a whole day there, spend hundreds of thousands of francs, and come back and feel happy. Do that probably every week, but not do it once a year with their families. A generation lower, they, differ, they, they don't find that of course. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thrilling, like, yeah. right? Yeah. So as you're thinking about your investments, as all this is being done, think about the long haul as well. Okay. You, you, you know, let's not coil ourselves and say Rwandese don't travel because we are basing on, on the figures that Belize gave us of the people who are spending today. That's not where mm -hmm. the, 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 even, even the people who are chartering those flights mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. spending those tens of thousands of dollars is because that investment was done five years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the same mindset that needs to be done with domestic tourism. And, and yeah, I like that yes, you said, yes, yes, yes. let's innovate some more yeah. with domestic mm -hmm. tourism. Yeah. Um, yeah. Barna, is there something you'd like to add before we go to a social media feed? Yeah, um, Belize mentioned something around um, the history of, of, of Kenya's tourism, and, and that keeps coming up because um, 
tourism, I think Kenya has done very well in terms of uh, promoting uh, domestic tourism. But back at home, I think uh, we need to do more in terms of uh, incentives because the private sector responds to incentives more than um, policy per se. But again, even an incentive can be in policy. And what do I mean? Um, right now, we are in a crisis mode. Um, people are worried about, uh, will I still have my job uh, two months from today? So we are still generally in a crisis mode. And so that means in terms of spending, people are watching uh, their expenditure. And then again, you look at the purchasing power, not so many people can afford um, to do transactions, for instance, in, in, in dollars. So how you, you craft uh, incentives that address, one, uh, the purchasing power, uh, but also allow the private sector to take the risk. Um, for instance, ahead of September, if you can get uh, schools to start uh, reaching out to parents, to book trips uh, around the country, um, get corporate companies to start booking, uh, AGMs, you know, I think that in a way can instill confidence and get the private sector to, to spend the money. Otherwise, I feel that uh, the government still uh, has a lot on its plate and it's difficult to, to, to be able to implement everything. Thank you, Brenna. And yeah, this is what you're saying, that um, government can't keep on doing mm -hmm. everything. So, yes. Yeah, but I think uh, to, to, to your point, um, it, Although I didn't, I didn't mention it, but there is a there is a strong uh, marketing campaign that is that is following uh, the, the announcement of the reopening, especially on the domestic tourism. Mm. And and when I say that we have segmented our targets, our target group, uh, you know, we actually, um, you know, for example, for the corporate organization, we are actually doing direct marketing. Um, you know, we're talking to the big the big corporate companies that we know of. You know, we are you know we're talking to them. You know, you should. You know, think about retreat um, now that even meetings and and, and uh, are, are opened. Mm. Um, you know, this is a very good way even as well to pitch um, uh, to this corporation. So, uh, the, 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 in the back end, if I can call it like that, there's a there's a lot that is going on. Um, you know, there's a lot that is going on even from the international on the international aspect. Um, we, we, we're not just sitting and thinking that you know people are going to to come. Um, we've had series of uh, of discussions with um, our market representation firms, for example. Uh, we have market representation firms that uh, represents uh, uh, RDB uh, in terms of travel and and and, uh, and uh, agents, travel agents uh, in the U.S., for example. And, you know, we've gone through all the specific guidelines. You know, we've explained every single detail. Um, and they started actually, you know, pushing out, you know, uh, um, into, into media, pushing out to the travel agents and talking about that Rwanda is actually open. Um, you know, we have a series of, of conversation with um, travel agents, um, travel agents, and we're interesting them um, to actually organize trips, uh, you know, talking on the side with Rondair, you know. So we are, we're kind of like forcing this to, to happen um, because, again, this is, this is a new way of, of working. Uh, we, have to, we have to innovate, um, but we even have to change the way we do marketing. Um, we're relying a lot on uh, direct marketing. Um, you know, we have in each of our, of our key, key source markets, we have identified key uh, private jet operators um, that we are targeting and talking to. Uh, for any questions, uh, you know, we have a way of communicating to them. Um, so, so although we've launched, you know, but in the back end, there's a lot of that is happening, both on the domestic aspect, even on the international aspect. And I agree with you, uh, Charles. Um, our private sector needs to actually look into this domestic um, market and, and find it interesting. Um, I know, of course, the challenge is that it doesn't yield a lot of, a lot of revenues mm. as opposed to international. But I mean, you know, the reality is that now we're actually relying on domestic tourism. And um, it's, it's, um, it's something that we have to really sit, you know, together with the private sector, you know, you know the public, the media, and craft something that is going to be sustainable for the domestic tourism. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right.
Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm just glad to see... something just uh, around the strategy around the domestic tourism and link it to the point uh, mm -hmm. you raised, Dan, around mm -hmm. Mombasa. Um, the most sustainable way in which we are going to look at domestic tourism is if we regionalize it and look at, the, at our domestic tourists as not only Rwandan. It's playing to the point that Bana said earlier on around purchasing power. It will be limited and it's not going to change overnight. Mm. But in as long as this domestic tourist is an East African tourist, mm. I have said this before, open the airspace. In as long as that guy is going to fly in from Dar es Salaam and come into Kigali and Tebe, wherever, 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 and pay the same rates as me who is traveling from Kigali to Kamembe, depending on the mileage, of course. Here we're, to, we're, 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 we're talking about something the business community has always been fronting, that the politicians have refused to listen to, and that is waiving things like airport taxes. These regional flights have to be domestic. In the long run, again, as I said, the sustainability of domestic tourism is a long haul mm -hmm. flight. But we I have like, to look at I it. I like how you say we need yeah. to think about it from an East African, yes, 162 yes. plus million people. Correct. Uh, you know? yes. I guess that's a conversation that mm. I hope people, will, especially politicians, will really implement post COVID 19, mm. opening up uh, the air skies. Let's go to some of our tweets. Uh, and the first tweet we have is um, uh, directed to Belize. And uh, if we could um, just very quickly have this on our screen. Um, and the first tweet is uh, from Loha, who is asking that, um, and I think this is great because you can clarify for a lot of confusion uh, in terms of uh, international flights. The tourists who do not come by charter or who do not necessarily visit gorillas and therefore come by commercial craft, what arrangements are envisaged for this category, uh, particularly concerning quarantine? I think you can shed light on the fact that right now there are no commercial flights yeah. and, and so yeah. forth. And Thank so you. Um, so, yeah, like you said, Diana, there are no commercial flights as of yet. Um, however, like we all know, uh, we, um, Rwanda is actually, um, is actually welcoming uh, residents mm -hmm. or uh, residents that live in, in, in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I think we all know the, proce the, the process. They have to be quarantined for seven days, etc. And there have been some set of... of a list of hotels that they can actually be um, be quarantined in. So so far for tourists, uh, we do not have any commercial flight uh, coming in as of yet. And when it happens, there are going to be specific guidelines that are actually relevant for the commercial uh, commercial flights. And uh, earlier, before the show before it, the show kicks off, I, I know you said that um, the flights that are even chartered that are coming in. Uh, have to be direct flights. Yes, so yes, 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 yes. To yes, avoid that is the condition. That is the condition. So even the the, the direct fly, um, sorry, the the private jets or mm -hmm. the the private charter flights uh, have to be direct. Okay. Because um, if you hop in from one one country, um, you you know the seventy two hours has to start from where you're coming from. Okay. Um, so just to just to minimize the risks. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we have the next tweet from Didier, um, who's also talking about uh, international flights, and Didier's question is. Um, what incentives uh, will be put in place for international airlines that have been severely affected by COVID-19? Attracting tourists should go with something encouraging international airlines to come back. Okay, um, I think I'll talk about uh, uh, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think we've seen in the news that Rwanda, government of Rwanda has actually um, uh, put a fund directive for Rwanda um, mm -hmm. in this situation, in this COVID. Um, uh, that's one, two. Um, like I said earlier, we have several conversations with the aviation sector uh, to be ready, actually, to, um, um, to first welcome, but even for Rwanda to start going into um, in traveling into, uh, internationally. So, so, but the thing with this is that it depends on other countries. Mm, you know? If other countries are closed, then we know we cannot fly and vice versa. So uh, th this situation is a situation that you have to, to go step by step um, and you have to go into, um, again, calculated risk. Uh, uh, but do it right. Um, so the incentive is there. Incentive has been done for for Rwanda specifically. And as far as the international airlines are concerned, I think it's it's about the the, the measures that have been put in place at the airport. Mm. Uh, you know, for example, for us, you know, when you talk about our crew, you know, putting putting a a, um, a requirement that the flight crew has to be you know, tested uh, 72 hours before as well. They have to be quarantined. We, we require them not to be moving around. 
things like that. I think it goes back to the safety um, from, from, the, from the airport all the way to, um, to the country. Uh, and our last tweet for today before we have closing remarks is uh, from uh, Viateur, who says the only way to attract domestic tourists is all about revising prices for affordable means and deepening local campaigns to instill the culture of visiting and many more. So mm -hmm. I think he echoes what um, yeah. Belize you've been saying yeah. earlier on and Charles and Berna. Berna, yeah. um, are there any closing remarks you'd like to give before I go to the panel, Belize and Charles? Um, I feel that... Um we should look at uh, revamping tourism as a, a patriotic act um, because the country has depended so much on tourism for a very long time. So we shouldn't feel that it is, um, it is just RDB's responsibility um, because if you look at the people who are employed uh, in the sector, it is Rwandans, the people doing business in the sector, they are Rwandans. So I would just kind of call out uh, everyone to see if, if, if you can, of course, afford it. Just um, have your honeymoon um, in Rwanda. Thank you very much. Uh, Bernard, uh, Charles? You have to be quick. very practical. Yes. When the government of Rwanda wanted to promote health, healthy people and well-being and what have you, we set up Kafri Day. We set up uh, compulsory sporting days across all government institutions and uh, compulsory testing for non-communicable diseases and sports day that whatever As you like are. saying, it was yes. deliberate. Yes, it was very, very deliberate. Yes. When it promote ICT, we remove taxes only, all these things. When you wanted to promote Made in Rwanda, you go to their office on Fridays. Mm. Everybody will be wearing Made in Rwanda in RDB. We have Made in Rwanda masks and so on and so forth. If we want to promote we have to be very deliberate about it. We may wake up in the morning and say, out of the 12 month salary that you earn, that one month, for instance, will not be taxed, pay as you earn or whatever. You'll get your gross on condition that you travel. For argument's sake. You know, we need to be very deliberate because the multiplier effect, and Belize said the value chain of everybody who is alone, even if you just go next door to, uh, what's the nearest place, the Richard Kant Museum mm. there. There is mm. somebody who will take you there. There is fees that you pay to enter. You go to Presidential Palace Museum around the corner. You, you know, there's somebody who will benefit, the fuel guy. There's so many people along the way that are mm. benefiting. So... I do not think that we have carefully thought about it, but it's a, a thanks to COVID, we have a huge opportunity <laughs> amongst ourselves. You know, you know, yes. the, the COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus has a silver lining. There's so many yes. elements of the silver lining we yeah. like talking about on the square, okay. and I think one of them is fast tracking or deepening, should I say, um, domestic tourism. Yes. And, and I, yes. I like the way you say it's our priority. Let's be deliberate. I love how Brenna says let's be patriotic. You know, let's let's put a lot more effort into into revamping um, Tembo Rwanda. Belize, closing remarks from you. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you again for having me here. Um, what I would like to, to say as a closing remark is that I would like to encourage Rwandans and foreign residents to actually take advantage of, of, of these packages. You know, you've talked about uh, the, the patriotic aspect. I think it's a very key aspect that I would, I would love to, to even build on, you know, in our marketing campaign because it's, it's, it's very key. We are relying now, tourism is relying, and in the, the people in the value chain are relying on um, Rwandans and foreign residents. Um, so I'd like to, to, to encourage um, uh, Rwandans, foreign residents to take advantage of these discounts, um, stay in a hotel, you know, um, you know, go out there, you know, have fun, enjoy what Rwanda has to give. And, um, and to your point, indeed, it's something that we need to really look into and, and be intentional um, exactly. to, to, to promote and drive uh, the domestic tourism. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to say. And, uh, you know, have fun, go out there, enjoy what's, what Rwanda has to give. I know for a fact I will be visiting the gorillas before 31st <laughs> December. Uh, I don't know about you, Berna, but I definitely will. And um, it's, it's great that there was a reduction in these prices. You know, it's, it's reading the room. It's mm -hmm. understanding what's happening and saying, you know, let's do this. And, 
incentivize local tourism. So thank you very once, uh, thank you again, once thank again, you. CTO. Uh, hopefully we'll have you a third time on the square, who knows? Even fourth and fifth. Exactly. Uh, so thank you very much for coming through Belize. Uh, Charlie, always a pleasure to have you. Brenna, always a pleasure to have you. Uh, and I'd just like to take this moment to say, please, please, please visit uh, www.visitwanda.com. We don't have it in our screens, uh, but just go to www visitwanda.com and you'll find all the information uh, CTO Belize has been talking about with us on the square tonight. I'd also like to thank our Made in Rwanda partners, Uzi Collections and Bourbon Coffee. Thank you for supporting the square. Keep the tweets going using uh, the hashtag the square RW as you can see on your screens. Um, lots of conversation and ideas coming off uh, our social media. So thank you to our viewers. Uh, have a good night and see you again next week. Thank you.